Good morning, everybody. During the last lecture, we have discussed the rotational motion and we have learned theta coordinate in rotational motion. We have learned angular acceleration. We have learned angular velocity and we have also discussed the relation between linear kinematics and rotational kinematics. So we have found relation between linear velocity and angular velocity, between linear acceleration and angular acceleration. So during this lecture, we will discuss the energy in rotational motion. Here on the right side, you see a blue ray, okay? So this has disc shape and this is the rotation axis in the center of disc, and then it is rotating around the Z axis, okay? This is the direction of the rotation. So it is rotating like this. So on this disc, we have many parts, okay? Different parts, and each part has different distance to the center, to the rotation axis. Each part on this, on this disc has different distance to the rotation axis, rotational axis. So, for this reason, each part of this disk has certain different velocity, which is given with Vi, okay? This is the speed of i particle, which is given with Ri times omega. Ri, the distance to the rotation axis. Here we have omega, which we have discussed during the last lecture. This is the angular speed, and angular speed is constant if this is a rigid body, okay? L let me tell you in this way, angular speed is same for all parts of this body here on this disk. So, then how to express the kinetic energy of the particle here or here or here on different parts of the Blu-ray, the kinetic energy of the particle, for example, located here in this side of the disk is given with one half mi vi square. mi is the mass of the i particle and vi is the speed of the i particle. And what we have here, look at this one. Here we have VI, okay? VI here is given with this expression, RI times omega. So just use it here, take the square of this expression, and then on the right side, we have one half MI, RI square times omega square, okay? So this is just the kinetic energy of the i particle. And on the blue ray, we have many particles, many different particles, okay? So then if you collect the total kinetic energy of the all particles, then we can get or we can calculate the total kinetic energy of this blue ray. And this is given with this expression. Here we have the kinetic energy of the first particle, we have kinetic energy of the second particle, third particle, and here we have sum of the all kinetic energies, okay? What do you see here? Here we have omega. Omega is the same for all particles on this disk, okay? If this is a rigid body. Then here we have one half, so one half is constant, omega is constant or omega square is constant. So take this one half and omega on the left side, okay? So then what we have here, we have kinetic energy, total kinetic energy of all its particles, which is given with one half. Here we have m1 r1 square plus m2 r2 square plus m3 r3 square so it goes times omega square so here within the bracket this expression within the bracket can be expressed the sum of mi ri square okay 
So what is this one? What is this term here within the bracket? The term within the bracket is called as moment of inertia and shown by I, okay? Moment of inertia. This term within the bracket. Let me show you with the pen. So this term within the bracket is given with I, moment of inertia, okay? And what about the unit of this moment of inertia? Here on the right side, we have mass, which is given in kilogram. And here we have R, I square. R is given with meter in SI unit system. Then the unit is kilogram meter square. This is the SI unit of I. So now let's go back to the kinetic energy. So here we have I, okay, here we have omega square, here we have one half. So then the rotational kinetic energy of a rigid body is given with this expression here. This is the rotational kinetic energy of a rigid body. So now the important thing here is that we have omega. Remember omega. Omega is angular speed of the body, okay? And we have extracted this term from the theta, angular coordinate, okay? Since theta, angular coordinate, remember the last lecture, this was the theta, this was the arc length S, okay? So this was the radius of the circle. And this theta is measured in radians, okay? And this omega is also given in radians per second. Don't forget this one. I have discussed this situation in rotational motion. If you are talking about alpha angular acceleration, if you are talking about omega, angular speed, if you are talking about angular coordinate theta, and if you are talking about the relation between linear and rotational kinematics, linear acceleration, linear speed, and linear coordinates, okay, for example, x, y, z. So you must always keep in your mind that this theta is given in radians. So this is given in radian per second. This is given in radian per square second, okay? Don't forget this information. So if you take revolutions per second or degrees per second, then you will get wrong result. So what was the unit of the kinetic energy? Unit of the kinetic energy is joule, okay? In order to get the joule as a unit for the kinetic energy, you have to use here radian per second for the angular speed of the body. Do we have any question here? Okay, here we have another important information. Look at the formula. Here we have kinetic energy, and this kinetic energy depends on moment of inertia, I, and it also depends on the angular speed, square of angular speed, okay? So, what about this moment of inertia? Let's consider that we have a greater moment of inertia. Then if we have a greater moment of inertia, then we will have a greater kinetic energy, okay? For a rigid body rotating with a given angular speed omega, okay? So let's consider that this omega is constant. And if I increase this moment of inertia, then kinetic energy of the rotating body will be greater, okay? So what about the kinetic energy? In chapter six, we have learned work energy theorem. So total work is given with delta K or K2 minus K1, okay? Let's consider that K1 is zero, okay? Then, the total work done on the particle is given with K2. 
right? So here in a rotational motion, K2 is given with one half I omega square. So if this rotating object, rotating body has greater moment of inertia, then it will have greater kinetic energy. So then you have to do a greater work to get this huge kinetic energy, okay? If you have a greater moment of inertia, then you will have greater kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy, then you have to do a greater work to get this kinetic energy. Is this part clear? If you have smaller moment of inertia, then you will have smaller kin rotational kinetic energy, then a less total work will be enough to get this rotational kinetic energy. Then let me explain this one here in this example. Here there is an apparatus and here we have some certain mass and another mass here and this is the rotation axis. This is the rotation axis. We rotate this apparatus around this rotation axis. Okay, so what do you see here? Mass close to axis. Here we have one mass and another mass. Both masses are close to the rotation axis. So since they are close to rotation axis, just have a look the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is given with mass, let's say this is M1 and this is M2. The total moment of inertia of this object, let's say, which is given with M1 R1 square plus M2 R2 square. So what do you see here? This R1 and R2 here, let's say it is given with this distance to the rotation axis. Okay, so here we have small r1, small r2, then we will have smaller moment of inertia. If we have here a smaller moment of inertia, then we will have smaller kinetic energy. So in order to get this smaller kinetic energy, a small total work will be enough, okay? So let me let me also remind you this expression and then you can get idea about the information which you have learned during the last chapters and also the information here you can establish a relation. So let me check this one. So let's consider that this object is staying at rest at the beginning and the initial kinetic energy of the system is zero, okay? Let's consider that this level is y is equal to zero. Then let's consider gravitational potential energy of the system is also zero, okay? And here we have v other. What is v other? You apply a force to rotate this one and you do a work, okay? So here we have the other. And what about the final kinetic energy of the system? Finally, we will have a rotational kinetic energy, which is given with one half I omega square. This is the angular speed. This is the moment of inertia of the system. And what about the final gravitational potential energy of the system, let's consider it is also zero, okay? So just write this expression, zero plus zero plus the other work done by the hand to rotate this apparatus, K2 plus zero. So then here we have the other work done by the and, and on the right side, we have the rotational kinetic energy, which is given with this expression. So if we have a smaller moment of inertia of this apparatus on the right side, then 
they will have smaller kinetic energy and then smaller V other will be enough to get this kinetic energy, okay? So this is the relation between the work energy theorem and rotational kinetic energy and also moment of inertia. So in this case here, we have the same apparatus, but the mass one and mass two are located far from the rotation axis. This is the rotation axis, okay? Look at the distance now. This is the R1 and this is the R2. Just compare the distance with the previous case. In the previous case, distance to the rotation axis is very small, okay? Here we have huge distance to the rotation axis compared to the previous case. So what about the moment of inertia for this apparatus in this second case? Here we have M1 R1 square plus M2 R2 square. Then you can calculate moment of inertia. So due to bigger distance or greater distance to the rotational axis, then we will have greater moment of inertia if we have greater moment of inertia, then we will have greater kinetic energy. If we have greater kinetic energy, then we have to do a more work to get this kinetic energy in this apparatus. Then harder to start apparatus rotating, okay? If an object, a body, has greater moment of inertia, then it is hard to start apparatus rotating. The object has a smaller moment of inertia, then it is easy to start apparatus rotating. So this is the relation between moment of inertia and work done by the other forces. Do we have any question in this part? Just with this information, I would like to show you a bio application. Here we have two birds. One is a hummingbird in Turkish sinek kuşu. And here we have an Andean condor. Andean condor in Turkish, Güney Amerika Tepeli Akbabası. Both birds are the example for the rotation. Let's consider that this bird has this rotation axis for this wing. Okay, this is the object. This is the wing of the bird. And this is the rotation, rotation axis for this wing. So here we have an Andean condor. This is the object. Okay. This is the rotation axis of the body. And there is another wing here, another object. And this is the rotation axis of this body, okay? When a bird flaps its wings, it rotates the wings up and down around the shoulder, okay? So these wings will be rotated in this trajectory. Okay, around this rotation axis. Also here. Here, I will explain the relation between moment of inertia and a bird's wing. On the left side, here on top, there is a hummingbird. This hummingbird has small wings with a small moment of inertia. So let me write the definition of moment of inertia. M I R I square. Just consider this wing has certain M, okay, let's say M1, and it has certain distance to the rotation axis, and this wing has mass two, okay, certain distance to the rotation axis. And then this bird, hummingbird, has a moment of inertia during 
bird flaps its wings. Okay, but since this bird has small wings, we have small r distance to the rotation axis, then we have smaller moment of inertia. Since moment of inertia is smaller, then kinetic energy, which is required to flap its wings, is smaller. One half i omega square. Since we have smaller moment of inertia, we need smaller kinetic energy. And then this bird can move its wings rapidly up to 70 beats per second. By contrast, look at the Andean condor. It has huge wings, immense wings, okay? With a large moment of inertia. So if you put here, if you put here bigger mass and bigger distance to the rotation axis, okay, then we will have bigger moment of inertia, then we will have bigger kinetic energy. So for this reason, this Andean condor flaps its wings at about one beat per second, okay, because more work is required to get this huge kinetic energy in case of ending condor. Do you have any question related to this bio application? I think it is clear. Now let me continue with the example. This is example 9.6 from the book, Moments of Inertia for Different Rotation Axis. Here we have three disks. Okay. And we have two rotation axes. One axis is like this. Let's consider this is one rotation axis. So then all the system is rotating around this rotation axis. Okay. And the other rotation axis is this one. Again, the same system. Here we have one disk, another two disks here. Now the rotation axis is this one. So we rotate this one around this rotation axis. So we have two rotation axis, okay? So then what is the question? What is this body's moment of inertia about axis one through the center of disk A perpendicular to the plane of the diagram. So the question is, what is the moment of inertia if this system is rotating about this axis? Okay. And the second question, what is its moment of inertia about axis two through the centers of disks B and C? What happens if this system is rotating around this axis? What is the moment of inertia in this case, in this second case, let's say. And then the final question is, what is the body's kinetic energy if it rotates about axis one with angular speed omega? So now let's calculate the moment of inertia in the first case. So here we have mass M, mass of A, MA, which is given, okay, but since this mass is located along the rotation axis, it does not contribute to the moment of inertia, then only this mass B and mass C contributes to the moment of inertia, then calculate the total moment of inertia for this system for the first case. The mass of this B object and the distance of this B object to the rotation axis and the mass of the C object and the distance of C object to the rotation axis. Okay, then this is the moment of inertia in the first case for the rotation axis one. And if the system is rotating about this axis, okay, then 
the mass B and mass C does not contribute to the moment of inertia, only A contributes, then the moment of inertia in this case mass of A and the distance between A and rotation axis, it is 0.4 meter, then you can calculate the moment of inertia in terms of kilogram per square meter. Then the last question, what is the body's kinetic energy if it rotates about axis one with angular speed omega, then the kinetic energy is given with this expression we have already calculated the moment of inertia for the first case here just use it here in this equation and then omega is given take the square of the omega look at this one we are writing this unit in radian per second don't forget if it is given in the question omega let's consider it is given for revolution per minute then you have to convert this one to the radian per second. Don't forget, okay? Then you can calculate the rotational kinetic energy of the system. Any question here? Okay, then let me continue with the moments of inertia of some common bodies. So here I will show you different shapes and different systems and then I will give you the moment of inertia of this bodies, but you can calculate this moment of inertia by yourself. At the end of my lecture, I will also teach you what is the method to calculate this moment of inertia of different bodies. Here in picture A, we have a cylinder rod and it is rotating around this axis. This is the rotation axis, okay? So it is rotating like this around this axis. So if this cylinder rod is rotating around this axis, then the moment of inertia of this rod is given with one over 12 ml squared. This is the total mass of the system. L is the length of this rod. But the same rod with the same mass and same length, but you are rotating this rod around this rotation axis. Now the rod is rotating like this, okay? Around this rotation axis, okay? Then we have different moment of inertia. Don't forget, same cylinder rod the same mass, same length, okay? But we have just changed the rotation axis. If you rotate the road through this rotation axis, then you have this moment of inertia. If you rotate the road on the right side, a rotation axis through one end, then the moment of inertia of the road is given with this expression. So now here we have a rectangular plate. Here on the left side in C, we are rotating this rectangular plate around its center, okay? So it is rotating around this rotation axis. Then we have moment of inertia given with this expression. This A is length of this part of the plate and this B is the length of this part of the plate. But if you rotate this thin rectangular plate about this rotation axis, then it is rotating like this, okay? So you have changed the rotation axis, then the moment of inertia of thin rectangular plate changes, okay? So you must be very careful with the rotation axis. Now let me continue with three different cylinders. One is hollow cylinder, the other one is solid cylinder, and the last one is thin walled hollow cylinder. In case of hollow cylinder, we have this moment of inertia, but be careful, we are rotating this cylinder along the axis 
passes through the center of the cylinder, okay? In, in three cases. But if you rotate this cylinder, for example, along this rotation axis, then everything will change. Don't forget this one. So here in E, in hollow cylinder case, we have inner radius of R1 and outer radius of R2. Then the moment of inertia of this cylinder is given with this expression. This M is the total mass of the cylinder. If this cylinder is a solid, okay, there is no hollow, then the moment of inertia is given with this expression, one half m r square, r is the radius of the cylinder. And then if we have a thin walled hollow cylinder, let's consider this thickness is very small, then this moment of inertia is given with m r square. So you can calculate again this moment of inertia by using the equation which I will show you at the end of this lecture. Now let me continue with the solid sphere on the left side in H. So solid sphere means that the inner part of the sphere is completely filled of the homogeneous material. And in case of thin volt hollow sphere on the right side, we have sphere like this. I am just showing the cross section, just consider that you have cut this into two pieces and you are looking inside of this sphere. So we have a thin wall here, okay? And inside of this we have nothing, it is empty, okay? In case of thin walled hollow sphere. So in case of solid sphere on the left side, we have this moment of inertia. If we rotate this sphere along this rotation axis. But if this is rotated around this rotation axis, then you must be very careful, okay? Again, if this thin walled hollow sphere on the right side rotated around this axis, then we have this moment of inertia. But if you rotate this sphere along this rotation axis, then you must be very careful with the moment of inertia. Okay, so now let me continue with the examples and then I will come to the calculations of moment of inertia for different bodies. Here we have a cylinder, okay, solid cylinder, this one. And we wrap non-stretching light cable around this solid cylinder. So let's consider that we have cable around this solid cylinder, many coils of these cables, okay? So then you put this end of the cable and pull it to the left side. Okay, this is the question. So here we have some important information. We wrap a light non-stretching cable. Light, light means you ignore the mass of the cable, okay? Then you consider that the cable is massless. And here there is a non-stretching, okay? There is no compressing or stretching the cable. Then this information is also given and the cylinder is solid, then you can use moment of inertia term for this case. Then mass of the cylinder is given, diameter of the cylinder is given. And another important information is given here that rotates in frictionless bearings about a stationary horizontal axis. So this is the rotation axis you can consider like this, okay? It is rotating around this axis like this. So we pull the free end of the cable with a constant nine Newton force for a distance of two meter. So this is the distance of two meter. 
Okay, we apply nine Newton to the left side. It turns the cylinder as it unwinds without slipping. This information is also very important. Okay, this type of questions. Without slipping means that there is a friction between the cable and cylinder. There is a friction between the cable and cylinder. If this cable does not slip, the cylinder is initially at rest, find its final angular speed and the final speed of the cable. Final angular speed and final speed of the cable. Okay, so now let's have a look. The work done on the cylinder, just consider this relation K1, U1, V other, and K2, U2. So just consider that this is the Y is equal to zero, and just take this gravitational potential energies are zero, okay? And then what about the initial kinetic energy of the system? The system is at rest at the beginning. The initial kinetic energy is zero. And what about the V other? So we apply a force and then we have displacement two meter, okay? Then V other is given with this expression F times displacement, nine Newton times two meter. Then in terms of joule, we have 18 joule V other. Okay, just put this V other here. On the right side, what about the kinetic energy? The kinetic energy of the system is given with the rotational kinetic energy of the cylinder, and the rotational kinetic energy is given with this expression, one half I omega square. What about the kinetic energy of the rope? Actually, rope is light. It means that it is massless. Since it has no mass, then there is no kinetic energy associated with the rope, then it is zero, okay, because mass is zero, then we have this relation. Okay, so what about the I here? I for the cylinder, moment of inertia for the cylinder is given with one half m r square, mass of the cylinder, and radius of the cylinder, then you can calculate moment of inertia for this cylinder, okay? Then what about omega? Omega is asked, work other is known, moment of inertia is known, then in radians per second, I can calculate angular speed of the solid cylinder, and what about the velocity of the cable, speed of the cable? Let me clean this part and let me show you the speed of the cable. So if you apply this force to the left side, then this rope will have certain velocity, okay? And this velocity is equal to the tangential speed of the object on the rim of the cylinder, okay? Then what about the tangential speed? Tangential speed is given with R times omega. We have discussed this one during the last lecture. And then radius of the cylinder and omega is found, put it there. Then finally, we have the speed of the rope. Any question with this example? Then let me continue with the example 9.8 from the book and unwinding cable two. We wrap a light non-stretching cable around a solid cylinder with mass M and radius R here on the right side in figure A. The cylinder rotates with negligible friction about a stationary horizontal axis so this is the rotation axis, but there is no friction or negligible friction in this rotational axis. We tie the free end of the cable to a block of mass. This is the mass tied to the free end of the cable. 
okay? And release the block from rest at a distance H above the floor. This is the floor, this is the H. As the block falls, the cable unwinds without stretching or slipping. Find the speed of the falling block and the angular speed of the cylinder as the block strikes the floor. So speed of the falling block, what is the speed of this falling block? And what about the angular speed of the cylinder? Okay, these two terms are asked. Okay, so then you can apply again this rule. K1 plus U1 plus the other, and what else? K2 plus U2, okay? So at the beginning, the kinetic energy is zero because the system is at rest and gravitational potential energy we have, okay? The gravitational potential energy is given with this expression. And what about the other? We have friction between the cable and the surface of this disk. But this friction does no work because the cable unwinds without stretching or slipping. The cable does not slip, okay? If it slips, then you have to consider friction force and the work done by the friction force. Since the cable does not slip, the V other work done by the friction force is zero. And on the right side, we have potential energy. So in the final case, just look at this B. In the final case, gravitational potential energy is zero and we have kinetic energy. But what about the kinetic energy? We have velocity of this box. Then this has certain kinetic energy. And this disk is rotating. Then it has rotational kinetic energy. So this is the final kinetic energy of the system, which is given with the kinetic energy of the box and rotational kinetic energy of the disk. And at the beginning, we only have gravitational potential energy. Then just write this equation here. So here on the left side, we have zero kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy at the beginning. And in the final case, kinetic energy of the box, rotational kinetic energy of the cylinder, and zero gravitational potential energy. Here, what about this expression? One half I omega square. I is one half MR square. Just take this one, put it there. And what about omega? V is given with R times omega. If you take omega, then you can get this expression. Just use this one here instead of omega just use this moment of inertia here. Then here we have moment of inertia and omega square here, okay? Then finally we have velocity of the box. Velocity is here. If you take this velocity also from this expression, then you can calculate the velocity of the box. It depends on the G and height of the box, okay? and then mass of the cylinder, capital M, and mass of the box. And the final angular speed of the cylinder is given with this expression. If you know the velocity, speed of the box, then if you know the radius of the cylinder, then you can calculate angular speed of the cylinder. Here we have two conditions. Let me also discuss these two conditions. Look at this expression. Here we have M, capital M, mass of cylinder, and we ha also have mass of the box, okay? Mass of the box and mass of the cylinder. So when M 
mass of the cylinder is much larger than the mass of the box, but about V. So this M is huge compared to this one, then the V will be smaller. Okay, if you use here very heavy cylinder, then the final velocity, final speed of the box will be very small. Okay, and if mass of the cylinder in the second case is much smaller than the mass of the box, so just consider that this mass is very small and this mass of the box here is huge, then what about this one? This term will go to zero and the velocity will be given in this expression to gh, okay? So the speed of a body that falls freely from height h, so this result. If the mass of the cylinder is very small compared to the mass of the box. These two conditions are important. Do you have any question with this example? Okay. In this question, we have considered that this cable here connects the disk and mass is massless, okay? We have given here a light rope or light cable. Also here, in this case, look at this one. Here we have a cable. We have considered that this cable is light, massless, okay? But what happens if this cable has certain mass? If this cable has certain mass here, then in order to consider that the mass is not negligible, then you have to learn the gravitational potential energy of an extended body. You have to know the gravitational potential energy of an extended body. Extended body, I have already explained in the previous lectures, if you have a long or complicated shape of a body, then we are talking about extended body, okay? So if you have a rope or cable, and if its mass is not negligible, then you need to know how to calculate the gravitational potential energy associated with such an extended body. So let's consider that the acceleration of gravity G is the same at all points on this body, then gravitational potential energy is given with this expression. Total mass of the extended body, G times the height of the center of the mass of the extended body, okay? So this is the position of the center of body relative to the floor, let's say, okay? So now we have Y center of mass, is the y coordinate of the center of mass. So then you can use this gravitational potential energy for the extended bodies. So later on, we will use this expression. Don't forget this one. Here, I would like to show you gravitational potential energy of an extended body. Here, you see an athlete. So at the beginning, let's consider he is staying like this. This is the initial position of the athlete. And here we have this bar. Look at the gravitational potential energy of this guy. Here, the gravitational potential energy is zero, okay? And here we have certain gravitational potential energy, okay? Here at this height. So, in order to jump over this bar, this guy should have at least the gravitational energy of this level, right? But sometimes with lower gravitational potential energy than this 
bar, the athlete can jump over this bar. How to do that? By using false furry flop. So what do you see here? This athlete arches his body so that his center of mass actually passes under the bar. So look at the shape of the athlete. So this leg has certain mass, the other leg has certain mass, this part of leg has certain mass, this part of leg has certain mass, and this part has certain mass, this arm has certain mass, and this hat has certain mass. Okay, so if you collect the total mass and if you would like to calculate the position of the center of mass, then this is the center of mass of this guy. Remember the discussion on the center of mass. Center of mass can be present out of the body, okay? So for this athlete with arch shape, the center of mass is here, okay? Then, what about the gravitational potential energy of this center of mass? Let's consider this is the ground. This is the H1. And the gravitational potential energy of this center of mass is given with MGH1, right? And what about the gravitational potential energy of this level, let's consider this is H2. The potential energy of this level is given M. If this guy is located here, M times G times H2. So what we see here, H1 is lower than H2. So the position of the center of mass for this guy has lower gravitational potential energy than this level. So then this athlete can jump over this bar, okay? So this is called as first bury flop in this type of sportive activity. So this method requires a smaller increase in gravitational potential energy than the straddling the bar. The center of gravity stays under the bar. So this guy here can be considered as an extended body, okay? She or he has a complicated shape and he or she has certain mass and from the position of the center of mass, we can calculate the gravitational potential energy of this extended body, and you can apply this information here if the cable here has certain mass, if the cable or rope has certain mass here, okay? If the mass is not ignored. Any question here? Then let me continue with the parallel axis theorem. This is very useful, very nice information. And probably during the exams, you will have at least one question related to this parallel axis theorem, okay? Listen carefully, it is very easy to keep in your mind. So here, we have a baseball bat, this one. Just consider that this is the center of mass this baseball bat, and we are rotating this baseball bat around this rotation axis. And the moment of inertia is given with I center of mass. If we rotate this baseball bat around this rotation axis. But let's consider that we are rotating this baseball bat around this rotation axis where we have point P, okay? Then the moment of inertia will change as I explained in the previous part of my lecture. So then here I have moment of inertia IP. So what about the moment of inertia for the point P? 
if we rotate this object around this rotation axis located at point P, then the moment of inertia of a body for a rotation axis through point P is given with this expression. Moment of inertia of a body for a parallel axis through the center of mass plus mass of the body times distance between two parallel axes. This is the rotation axis around the center of mass and this is the rotation axis around point P and this is the distance between two rotation axes, okay, D. So this expression is known as parallel axis theorem. Here we have one axis, another axis, they are parallel to each other, so the name is parallel axis theorem. So don't forget, this is very useful formula for this chapter and also for the forthcoming chapter. Then let me apply this parallel axis theorem in this example 9.9. Here we have a part of a mechanical linkage. This has a mass of 3.6 kilogram. Its moment of inertia IP around an axis of 0.15 meter from its center of mass is given kilogram times meter square. So this is the center of mass. And this is the axis through the center of mass. And here we have P point, and this is the axis through the P point. And this is the distance between center of mass and P point. What is the moment of inertia about a parallel axis through the center of mass? So just write this parallel axis theorem. The moment of inertia for the rotation axis through P is given with the moment of inertia center of mass plus M. Okay, so this IP is given in the question. Mass is given. Distance, where is the distance? Distance is also given, okay? So this is given, this is given, this is given. Then moment of inertia of center of mass is asked. Then you can easily calculate this one. So let me finish this chapter with moment of inertia calculations. In the previous part of my lecture, I have shown you different shapes of bodies. Here we have a cylinder rod. Here we have another cylinder rod with different rotation axis. Okay, so then we have different moment of inertia. And here we have rectangular plate, thin rectangular plate with different rotation axis. And we have given the moment of inertia. So how to calculate this moment of inertia for different bodies with different shapes, with different rotation axis, how to calculate this one. So this can be done by using integral, okay? So let's consider you have a huge body and then divide this body into elements of mass dm that are very small, okay? Then Remember the formula for the moment of inertia. What do you see here? It is same, okay? Here we have small element of mass, and here we have distance to the rotation axis. And here we have dm. Instead of dm, I can write this expression. Remember the density. Density rho is given with dm over dv. Then instead of dm, I can write rho times dv, right? Volume of the object. And this is the distance to the center of mass. Then this formula can help us to calculate the moment of inertia for 
a rigid body with a continuous distribution of mass. OK, so this formula is very important to keep it in your mind. Actually, so if you know this formula, you can easily remember this form of this formula. Everything is same. Here we have sum of mass times R square for each part of the object. And here we have dm times R square and integral over. OK, that's all. So same formula, just replace dm with this rho times dv. OK, that's all. Please keep this formula in your mind, then it will be very easy for you to calculate the moment of inertia of different bodies with different rotation axes. So by using this formula, geophysicists can measure the Earth's moment of inertia. They have this information. This calculations tells us how our planet's mass is distributed within its interior. So what about the outer part of the Earth and what about the density in the inner part? And the data show that the Earth is far denser at the core than in its outer layers. So I will show you one example with a perfect spherical shape, then you can better understand this example. So now let me finish my lecture with two examples. We will calculate the moment of inertia of different bodies. One has a hollow or solid cylinder rotating about axis of symmetry. OK, this is the rotation axis. Solid cylinder is this one. OK, and hollow cylinder is this one. So now let's start with the hollow cylinder. OK, this is the inner part of the cylinder. This is outer part of the cylinder. And this cylinder has certain length L and the inner radius is given with R1. Outer radius is given with R2. And this is the rotation axis, this one. So here we choose a small volume of cylinder with the thickness is given with dr, okay? And the radius is given with r. Distance from the rotation axis is given with r, and thickness of the cylinder is given with dr. Then length of the cylinder is given with l. So then what about mass of this small volume element, which is given with rho times dv? What about the volume of this element, 2 pi r l times dr? OK, this is the volume of this cylinder. And then how to calculate the moment of inertia of this guy r squared times dm. We have already calculated dm, put it there. Then what about the integral limits for the r? It starts from the inner radius to the outer radius, from r1 to r2. If you solve this integral, then you will get this result. This is the moment of inertia for this hollow cylinder. So here we have pi rho L this term. So what about the volume of this cylinder? Total volume of this cylinder. The total volume of this cylinder is given with this expression. OK. Pi L r2 square minus r1 square. OK, this is the total volume of the cylinder. And if we multiply with the density, then we can calculate the total mass of the cylinder. So total mass of this cylinder is given with pi L rho times 
R2 square minus R1 square. This is the outer radius of the cylinder. This is the inner radius of the cylinder. So just write this expression here. Total mass of the cylinder is given pi L rho R2 square minus R1 square. Okay, this one. Then look at this expression. Here I have pi R L R2 square minus R1 square. So instead of this expression, I can use mass, this one, which we have calculated here. Okay, then, then just put here mass, then moment of inertia of this guy is given with one half m r2 square plus r1 square. Okay, this is the moment of inertia of this hollow cylinder. This one. Final result. So now let me discuss the results of this equation for different conditions. In the evaluation part, it is explained. Let's consider that the cylinder is solid. If the cylinder is solid, then R1 is zero and R2 is R, okay? Here, look at the formula. Moment of inertia is given with one half M R1 square plus R2 square. So if the cylinder is solid, then this is zero. This is given with R square. Then the result is moment of inertia for solid cylinder. And if the cylinder wall is very thin, then R1 is roughly is equal to R2. It is equal to R. OK, we are talking about thin walled cylinder. This is the R1. And this is the outer radius R2. And we just consider that R1 is roughly equal to R2 and they are equal to R. OK. In case of thin walled cylinder, then within this equation, just take this equation, I is equal to one half M. Instead of R1 squared, just use R squared. Instead of R2 squared, just use R squared. Then the result is M R squared. There will be two R squared here, and we have another two here. They will cancel each other. So the moment of inertia of thin volt cylinder is M R squared. Now, Let's go back. This is the table 9.2 and picture E, hollow cylinder. Moment of inertia is this one. This is the solid cylinder. Moment of inertia is this one. This is the thin walled cylinder, hollow cylinder. The moment of inertia is this one. So you can do the same for the solid sphere. You can do the same for the thin walled hollow sphere. You can do the same for this rectangular plate axis through center, thin rectangular plate axis along the edge like this. So you can calculate all this moment of inertia for different bodies for different rotation axes. Let me finish. This chapter was this example 9.11 uniform sphere with radius r axis through center. So here we have a uniform sphere and we have a rotation axis. It is rotating around this axis. OK, so in order to calculate the moment of inertia for this sphere, you have to use this formula r square 
rho dv, this formula. Okay, so then in order to calculate this integral, we choose a disk here. This disk has certain radius r, and this is the radius of the sphere from the center, which is given with capital R. And this is the distance between the disk and center of the sphere. And this is the thickness of the disk, dx. OK, then you can get this expression for the radius of the disk, which is given square root of r square minus x square due to this triangle. You can do that. OK, and what about dv of this sphere, volume of this disk? The volume of disk is the area of the disk, pr squared, times thickness of the disk, which is given with dx. Instead of r, just use this one. Then you can calculate volume of the disk. Just put this volume here. OK, and then now we have di. What is di? Moment of inertia of this disk around this rotation axis, okay, which is given with one half r square dm instead of r square, just take square of this one instead of dm rho dv. We have calculated dv here, put this one here, then we have dm, then finally di, moment of inertia of this small disk with small thickness, we have this moment of inertia. So what about x? x starts from 0 to the r, OK? And this side from 0 to the r, OK? So if you take integral from 0 to r, then we have pi rho over 2, this expression dx. So keep this expression dx within the integral and take this one out. And here we have 2. Why 2? Because we have half of the sphere here. Integral limits from 0 to r. And we have another half of the sphere for the integral from 0 to r, OK? Then you can write in total 2, 0 from r, OK? So this is what we have done. So then you can calculate moment of inertia like this. So what about the volume of the sphere? It is given with this one. This is the volume of the sphere, OK? So just Look at this one. Rho density is given with, here we have a rho. Rho is given mass over volume. And just take this volume, put it there. Instead of rho here in this expression, just use this rho, which we have calculated. Then finally, moment of inertia of this sphere is given with 2 over 5 times m r squared. 2 over 5 times m r square. So if we have 10 volt hollow sphere, then you have to apply the discussion which we have used in the calculations of moment of inertia for hollow cylinder. Then you can also calculate the moment of inertia for 10 volt hollow sphere. So with this one, I finish my lecture. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.